up that way too let's try that one more time good morning everybody good morning and welcome to worship what a joy it is to be here together to worship our lord jesus christ i invite you to stand this morning as we join together in song joy to the world what a joy it is to sing Thanks, amen. amen. Christmas time is such a favorite because all the songs are so familiar. We've sang them for years and years, and they never change. <laughs> Yeah. 
Have a seat, everyone. Thank you. You guys can have a seat if you want. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks to our music team, uh, for Amanda for leading, and for Shane, Jerry, Linda, and Heather. We appreciate you and your willingness to, to serve this morning. And uh, thank you for those of you who are here in person with us and those of you connecting with us uh, online. Um, as we consider uh, this season, uh, we certainly uh, we love celebrating the recognition of the birth of Christ, but part of uh, Advent is to remember that Christ is coming again. And, uh, and so we place ourselves in between uh, those things. And to that end, let me read for you these, these words from uh, the book of James. In the New Testament, it says, Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, and as, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. And as you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and of mercy. And as we just pause to pray here this morning, maybe there's something that uh, you feel a little impatient about. And, uh, and it would be good for us in reflection of not only that Christ has come, but he is coming again. And uh, those things that are undone, that he will complete, uh, that we can commit those to him afresh. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we, um, we come before you and we acknowledge you as sovereign over all the earth. We thank you, our God, for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the recognition at this time of year of a celebration of his birth. But we also, Father, are important to be reminded that uh, Jesus promises to come again. And in the in-between times of that which we celebrate and that which we anticipate, there can be frustration and impatience, worry, and so, God, would you hear our prayer before you? Would you take those things which we try to hold too tightly, perhaps, and allow you, Father, to bring worth and value in your time? Give us the strength to persevere. Give us encouragement among one another. And may in all things, Father, we bring glory to Jesus. And we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, this, uh, this past um, Thursday, we had the opportunity to celebrate Christmas with our uh, friendship club, friendship group on Thursday night, and uh, it was a really, it was festive and joyous. Uh, the room was full here, and, uh, and the singing was all over the place. 
but incredibly full of joy. And, uh, and so thank you to those of you who uh, also uh, took time to, to join us and those of you who've been participating on, the, on those nights uh, over the course of these, this last uh, quarter or so. Um, and, uh, and so coming up uh, next, let me just first say coming up, our Christmas continues and we'll have uh, Christmas with our, our youth on Friday night. But let me first mention uh, Christmas on next Sunday, December 18th, when you come. Our Christmas um, uh, offering, our special Christmas offering that we take every year, um, have opportunity to, to give towards this year, is centered in uh, providing scriptures for um, people in Ukraine. So we'll be giving um, uh, boxes of scriptures to churches in the Ukraine and uh, through Empower Ministries. And so uh, each box is uh, $25. Each bundle is $25. So therefore, any portion of that $25 that you can provide helps to provide uh, scriptures to uh, the local churches to give. As they serve local tangible needs, they also then get to provide a, uh, a portion of scripture to them, a New Testament uh, to uh, to the people that they're serving in in the Ukraine, and so would you consider that? And if you if you do, and you're writing checks out in advance, and you write the checks out to Empower Ministries, and we're gonna have a special offering. Uh, we're gonna bring our smiley face buckets out. Uh, we're gonna have a special offering uh, during the service next Sunday, and uh, we'll look forward to that. Now next Saturday we have a Kid Jam Christmas C is for Christmas event. Uh, 3 o'clock to 4.30-ish uh, here. and But we do need to know if you're going to come so that we can make sure that we have enough of the see things that we are hoping to do. And so would you simply just send an email or contact the office uh, for us? And for those of you who uh, receive the e-bulletin, it's actually, if you click on the image, it takes you right to the email, and then you just have to press send. I know. It's so easy. One-stop service. That's what we try to do. Uh, but we would love to be able to celebrate with all of you uh, next, uh, next Saturday in a Kid Jam uh, C is for Christmas uh, edition, and uh, that'll be a lot of fun. There'll be cookies, candy canes, carols, cartoons, cameras, cocoa, crafts, Christ story, and confetti, no, there won't be confetti, but it's a C word. Carrots, there will be no carrots. No carrots. It's a carrot-free environment. We have some people who are allergic to eating carrots at Christmas. <laughs> Chips. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Chocolates. Yeah. Yeah, you see, you get, all of a sudden you get confused because now we're into cho words instead of co words. And anyway, that's the way my mind operates. We love kids, right? Uh, and, uh, and so we're just really thankful for uh, the opportunity to come alongside families in that. And uh, today we want to just uh, do a little something, uh, take a couple of minutes to do a little something uh, special. And uh, in order to do that, I need, uh, I need Teresa. Teresa, can I just borrow you for a second? Now, Teresa doesn't know that I'm doing this. Because if she did know I was doing this, she would be away. <laughs> and then she would want to prepare. Hi. You, you need to come in here cause so the camera can see you too. Yeah. Hi. So, <laughs> so some of you will remember uh, that um, uh, at the beginning of the year, you might remember this little story. At the beginning of the year, Teresa came to me and said, um, uh, I've been teaching Kid Jam, and uh, I really think it's time for me to transition out of Kid Jam. And because um, she's been, uh, her passion is teaching. God gifted her as a teacher, and, and she's been able to uh, get full-time work teaching in, uh, in our public schools. And, um, and so uh, just, it just seems, she just said, I think it's time to transition out of that. And uh, I said, okay, no problem. Uh, be really sad for me because I really love uh, working with her. Um, but no problem. I said, would you just be willing to be patient and allow us to pray into this? Let's see who we can identify and, uh, and then we'll, we'll 
have a transition take place. And so that's what we did over those first few months of the year. And uh, we prayed into that. We kind of observed uh, some, some things and some people. And uh, as, as then you know, Michaela, uh, um, we, uh, we recognized uh, God, uh, God working in Michaela's life and, uh, and asked her if she would consider uh, being, uh, being our new Kid Jam uh, director, and uh, then Teresa would work in transition with her. And that's a really cool thing. So not only did uh, Teresa say, hey, uh, you know, I love Kid Jam, I love kids, but I think it's time to transition. She was also willing uh, to work a transition out with uh, with uh, Michaela, and I think that is just really awesome leadership. Not only are you a lot of fun uh, and creative, and uh, if you, if we still have a Kid Jam SEMC channel, and if you want to see some of that stuff uh, of the entire Searsma family for two and a half years, uh, you you can. It's there forever uh, on the World Wide Web, and uh, so we really, we we really, really appreciate that. Can we just show her our appreciation for? So, um, so how do you how do you thank uh, Teresa for serving uh, for serving the Lord and serving our families? Uh, just so I could probably count, uh, there's probably less than uh, this many Sundays that she's missed over the course of that of the course of that ten years. It's an incredible commitment uh, and uh, certainly a precedence that we do not impose on Michaela. Uh, so. Let's just be clear. Uh, but we are so thankful because it's just given us stability uh, in, in the middle of uh, all kinds of changes as we've gone through the years. And we've certainly grown together. Our families have grown together. And, um, and so really appreciate you. And so how do we thank you? Uh, that was the biggest challenge. Uh, somebody who won't say, well, I don't need anything or just give it to somebody else, right? Yeah, so I know. So we had back Take Your Kid to Work Day this fall. And uh, Abigail da Costa, we tasked her with a secret project that's been going on for the last few weeks. And so it actually took longer than one day. And, uh, and so what she did is she contacted a number of people and families and asked them to write one word on a card that would describe who you are. And then they would, could also write a little comment to you. So it's something you can't give away. It's something you have to read. And as you read it, you reflect on the fact that this is what God has done through me. Even sometimes you don't even see, it, see that in yourself. I know that, right? You don't see that in yourself. But I want you to know just how awesome, how privileged we are to have God use you in our church family in this way over these 10 years. And so there's lots of things written on here that I, that I won't I won't give you. And so then, uh, what else can we do that you can't give away? Well, maybe you, you might try to give this away, but I've made it really, really hard for you to try to give it away. So um, here's a, uh, a $50 gift certificate to uh, Marble Slab Ice Creamery. So you'll find that hard to give away. So, <laughs> and, uh, and here's a gift certificate for all the chicken parm you can eat at Eastside Mario's. Those are two things that she'll find very hard to give away. <clears throat> and I'm going to give you these cards in a minute. But the other thing that we did, so Abigail took all those cards, and then she came up with a list. And then we, uh, we um, put it into a word cloud generator. And then uh, we gave it to Lila, who made it beautiful. And, uh, and so you can put it up on the screen there now. Um, but this is, this is uh, from, from us to you. Um, with all these words. And so Kid Jam's the biggest. So the words, as a word cloud, for those of you who don't know what a word cloud is, you put in words, and the more I don't, if you have, like, for instance, uh, dedicated was probably mentioned the most, and so it's a bigger word in the, in the word cloud. And so this word cloud represents how we feel about you. And just so we can't, if you might not be able to read all these words, let me, let me read them out. This is how people view you, okay? It's going to make you really uncomfortable. You ready? <laughs> Is she walking out of the camera? <laughs> All right. Dedicated, creative, engaging, sacrificial, commitment, loving, devoted, passionate, thorough, generous, genuine. Oops. Goes over. 
uh, compassionate, accommodating, faithful, caring, wise, fun, time, consistent, thoughtful, willing, enthusiastic, kind, smart, and awesome. So we, uh, so here's all the, the words separately from everybody, and then they've written some notes on that as well. How are you feeling? <laughs> Overwhelmed. That's for you. So uh, do you want to say anything? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, sure, probably be good. And then I'll pray for you, okay? Well, I wanted to say thank you to all of you because, of course, we can't have Kid Jam without our volunteers. And there's been a lot of people that have volunteered over the years. So many people that help make Kid Jam happen. And I couldn't do it without all of you. So thank you to everybody who has volunteered. And thank you to those that still volunteer because that's how we run Kid Jam. And thank you, huge thank you to Michaela and Josh who have taken over so well and so creatively and brought lots of life back in the Kid Jam. So I'm very thankful for them. And it's been great working with you as well. And uh, all the SEMC staff. And again, thank you to everybody who volunteers with Kid Jam each and every week. And, and I still have a couple kids in Kid Jam, so thank you for um, influencing them as well. So yeah. thank you. Yeah. And thank you for all your love and support over the years. And we're still here, and we'll still be involved in Kid Jam in any other way we can help. And upward. And upward. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That too. But thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. For this is very, very thoughtful and kind. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to pray for you first. All right. Hey, uh, we really appreciate her, right? And uh, God is used, continuing to use her. And so let's, uh, let's just pray and commit her to the Lord. As she said, she's not going anywhere. It's a transition, and uh, it's awesome, and it just reflects everything good about what we've been learning about over these last number of years. So, Father, we just thank you for your gift to us of Teresa and her family. We thank you, God, for the sacrifice that they have made willingly, uh, the uh, energy and creativity and enthusiasm we thank you for the days in which uh, they drag themselves to do that which you've called them to do, but maybe they're not up to it. Thank you for enabling them in those days. But we thank you most of all for the love of Jesus shining through her life and their life together. And we pray, Father, that you would bless them, that you would continue to use them as a blessing to others, and uh, that you would help them to recognize uh, the significant difference that they have made in children's lives and in families' lives for these last 10 years. It's intangible, it's immeasurable, and it's incredibly important to you. And so for representing you well, we give thanks. And all God's people said, amen. Yeah. I'm going to give you a hug in front of everybody. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. She just said I didn't need to do all that, which is exactly why we did all that. <laughs> because if I had asked her, should we do something, she would say no. We'll have a music team. Uh, oh, we're going to, speaking of Kid Jam, how could I forget after all of that? So if you haven't yet... Uh, um, let us know that you're going to be here on Saturday. Then uh, please uh, register to let us know uh, that we can expect you and your, your, your students. And then now we can uh, have our kids age 2 to grade 6 uh, make their way out to Kid Jam. Parents of 2, 3, 4, and 5-year-olds, you need to sign them in and then sign them back out at the end of the service. Uh, Mrs. Keita has gone ahead of you. Thank you so much for that. And please stand as we continue in worship.
seated. You just wanted to keep singing. That's okay. We can. Yeah. Thank you so much. If you have your Bibles, uh, you want to turn with me to Ruth chapter 3. And uh, we're going to anchor ourselves there. We'll uh, We'll venture off into a couple of different places uh, as we go through this morning. But I want to start by um, just reading these first three, the first nine verses of Ruth chapter three, as you get it there in your Bible or your Bible app. It says, one day, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, my daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. Now, Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes, and go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you're there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying, then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. And so she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. And when Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain. And Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned, and there was a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? he asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. Father, as we uh, come to your word and as we reflect on uh, the songs that we've sung, uh, as we reflect on our own lives and the things that are going on in our lives, would you help us to be attentive to how you would direct us? Uh, Would you uh, cause us to love you all the more and to recognize your goodness towards us in new ways? And so would you teach us by your spirit? Would you teach those around us, uh, those that we care about, uh, those, Father, who might seem far off on the external, uh, but, God, have a longing for you internally. Would you renew our desire uh, to demonstrate the love of Jesus towards them as well? And so we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. In just, a, in just a few short weeks, a team from uh, our church family will be making their way to El Salvador. It's hard to believe, January 7th. It'll mark the 13th year of our mutually beneficial involvement in the country of El Salvador. We're going to be going to build homes for 12 families. Those homes become symbols of hope. They are provided through faith. They serve to bring peace to individuals to families, and to those communities in which we build. That peace will turn to joy. It will turn to emotional expressions of joy, as well as the joy which comes from a humble recognition that God is still in control of their lives. In the rural parts of El Salvador, where our teams have been, there are many differences in culture to witness and to respect. Among those curious things that we might see is along the sides of the highways and along some of the cement roadways. In the morning when our team might head out, uh, we'll often see a person with several bags of grain, and they'll be spreading that grain along the shoulder of the road, of the highway. And in the evening when we return, we might also then see that same person scooping the grain back into these large sacks. Sometimes if we return early, we may actually catch a glimpse of them placing a tool of some kind and lifting the grain into the air, letting it cascade back down to the ground, back down to the asphalt. In fact, they'll do that several times throughout the day. And uh, the reason for that is on the blacktop of the pavement, under 40 degree plus sunshine, 
the grain dries out a little quicker. And as the grain dries, the outer husk of the grain will loosen. And that loosened husk, when it is lifted and spilled out, will blow away in the wind. This is the chaff. It's worthless and it's dry. Letting the chaff fly enables the grain to remain. The grain is what is valuable. It is purchased by others who are willing to pay a better price for better quality grain. Therefore, I think you might agree with me that separating the grain from the chaff is an important and essential task. And for those of us, and I include myself in this, which is not a surprise to those of you who know me, we're not familiar with these things. This task is called winnowing. See, when we enter into Ruth chapter 3, we find Boaz winnowing barley. It's been there for at least, a, it has been harvested for at least a couple of months, so it's now dried. And once dried, it's taking to, taken to this place called the threshing floor. It's a place of dry, hard ground or, or rock where hooved animals would walk on the barley to crack the husks of that grain. And then the winnowing would take place, not on the side of the highway, but on this same threshing floor. The threshing floor is an outdoor, open-air space. The threshing floor is where the chaff flies. The threshing floor is where wheat, where what is valuable, is cultivated and kept. And when you understand this, then you, it makes more sense as to why Boaz would be sleeping on the pile of grain after spending the day winnowing. That grain is valuable, and it could be stolen. And so he's providing security and assuming risk that an owner can only truly understand. And after a hard day's physical labor and after a satisfying meal, Boaz sleeps on the grain with a blanket as his covering. At some point in the evening, Ruth comes on to the threshing floor at the instruction of her mother-in-law, Naomi. And she gently lifts the corner of Boaz's blanket and then lays down at his feet. At some point in the night, likely around midnight or so, Boaz feels the coolness of the air and is startled by the presence of another. And it's Ruth. Ruth responds the way in which Naomi has instructed her by asking Boaz to spread his blanket to also cover her. And she gives this reason in verse 9. Since you are a kinsman or a guardian redeemer. Now, at this point, it's probably, good, it's probably a good idea for us to address maybe a couple of other cultural differences that stand out to our 21st century minds. The first is this. Is Boaz drunk? Right? Given the language that is used uh, and to describe him throughout this book and his, the overall testimony of his character, the answer is no. In some English translations, we read terms like this. Uh, he was in good spirits. In others, we read when his heart was merry or very contentedly. All of these try to convey a sense of pleasure, a sense of satisfaction, a sense of gratitude or contentment, a sense of peace. The second thing that we probably is good to think about is this whole lift your blanket, spread your blanket thing, is that code for sex? Because am I the only one who thought that? Okay, good, I'm not. Okay, it's, but it's not code for sex. Again, it's worth reminding ourselves that the threshing floor is an outdoor public place. By the way, is talking about sex in church, is that uncomfortable for some of you? Okay, good. Um, it's an outdoor public place. In addition to the overwhelming testimony of both the character of, the people, of, of both people involved, we understand that they both are humble people. They're people of integrity with service to the Lord, and they are, they are caregiving. They have a generosity towards others. It's also a reminder that throughout Scripture, God has no problem describing sex. Anybody read through the Bible? Sex is described with beauty as a privilege within the context 
of a mutually submissive, covenant-keeping marriage relationship between a man and a woman. And God has no time describing that. He also describes the, the issue, the idea of sex and its consequences outside of his ideals. Now, that being said, there is a cultural symbolism that is taking place here. As the blanket, or as some of your English translations might read, garment isn't just a simple covering. For many Hebrew men, it, it has significance. It's called a talit. And the covering would have tassels hanging on the corners. And those tassels are to be tangible reminders of the Torah, the Jewish law, and the importance then of honoring God with all of their lives. They would be used, this talit or blanket would be used in times of prayer. They would, by, by some of them, they would, they would drape them across their shoulder all throughout the day, or some of them would wear them underneath their cloak. And so when Ruth lifts the corner of the talit or the blanket, and she extends her open hand, she's asking an important question. And that question that is being made without speaking those words is, would Boaz consider marrying her as part of her relation, as part of his relationship with God? Her hand is extended for mercy. She has confessed the chaff of her life and is wondering if Boaz can see her value. On Boaz, on, on his side, Boaz would also understand the significance of this gesture. He hadn't settled for other options in the course of his life, despite the fact that he's obviously more advanced in age than she is. His desire has always been to honor God. And so when he responds to Ruth, he acknowledges that he is saying yes to her, but he is saying yes to God first. And now listen to his response. Because in it, he also encourages Ruth and helps us all to appreciate the importance of integrity. Let's continue that in verse 10. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I am a guardian redeemer of our family, there is another who is more closely related than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to do his duty as your guardian redeemer, good. Let him redeem you. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. Boaz's response to Ruth is not based on emotional arousal, and it's not based on pity. His response is steeped in integrity and in godly character and in reality, and a commitment to pursue that which honors the Lord above all else. See, these are the kinds of things that happen on the threshing floors of our lives. Now, I recognize that it is extremely unlikely that any of you at your home have an open-air threshing floor. Am I wrong in that? If so, raise your hand. But we do have chaff that needs to fly from our lives, don't we? So it's important for us to learn about the significance about how, of how the Lord interacts with people on the threshing floor throughout the unfolding of Scripture, and then consider how He might want to then interact with with you and with me. I want you to notice first that on the threshing floor of our lives where the chaff flies, our sinful condition is revealed. Now, I know, I know it's not popular to talk about the concept of sin or sinfulness and the consequences of sin these days. I know, I know. But popularity doesn't make something more or less true. God is holy. He has a standard of holiness. And any deviation from that standard is sin. It misses the mark of his holiness. That's what sin means. We often consider sin in terms of actions, outcomes. However, it's important to recognize that those actions flow from desires, inclinations, or propensities that go unchecked. Our natural human nature is sinful, 
the danger is that we get used to making decisions that fail to reflect the holiness of God and we no longer recognize sin from God's perspective. However, no, however, no matter how subjective we justify ourselves before others, God is the one who sees the motive of our hearts and the actions then that result from it. And he is never fooled. In fact, he reminds us in Hosea chapter 13 that those that those actions will be like chaff. Here's what he reads. Here's what it says in, in Hosea 13. When Ephraim spoke, people trembled. He was exalted in, in Israel, but he, has, he became guilty of Baal worship and died. Now they sin more and more, and they make idols for themselves from their silver, cleverly fashioned images, all of them the work of craftsmen. It is said of these people, they offer human sacrifices. They, ki they kiss calf idols. Therefore, they will be like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears, like chaff swirling from a threshing floor, like smoke escaping through a window. And for those who have been learning along with us these last few months, you may recognize these verses and be reminded of our learning series through the book of Hosea during the, summer, during the summertime, where we recognize the mercy of God being extended to those, even those who might feel there's no other way to live. The mercy of God is relentless even to penetrate the darkness and the hardness of sin. Further, God reminds us that those whose, whose lives persist in sin and oppose God's purposes are like chaff. The sinful condition of our world is not removed from God's sovereignty, nor does it stand in the way of the advancement of his kingdom purposes. Where the chaff flies, sin will be exposed and evil will be removed. I want you to notice, secondly, that on the threshing floor of our lives where the chaff flies, that our value is, our value is realized. We can't know for sure what Ruth's m mindset was as she went onto the threshing floor that night. Here she was, a widow widowed woman, a foreigner in a strange land, far from her family, living a life that she likely never anticipated. It's possible that she might struggle with understanding her own value, her own sense of worth as a result of these things. She might struggle with her identity or even her purpose as a result of just so many years of struggle. And that's why the experience of a young man named Gideon during the same time period of rampant evil is important for us to consider. And if you look back just a few chapters in your Bible at Judges chapter 6, you realize that our consistent commitment to honoring the Lord by doing simple things faithfully is highly valued from his perspective. When we look at his, the interaction, his interaction on the threshing floor, we notice that God, that God sees us for who he's created us to be. He comes to us in our despair, but he is too gracious to leave us there. Look at what he sees in Gideon I'm going to start reading chap Judges chapter 6 and verse 11. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash, the Abizrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength that you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Uh, pardon me. My lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. And the Lord answered, I will be with you. Remember, this is a time and a culture 
where evil is rampant. And it can have a negative effect on how people view the world around them and even view themselves. But what does the angel of the Lord see? How does God view Gideon? Even when he can't see it himself. He views him as hardworking. That is, Gideon is threshing wheat in a wine press. It's labor intensive, and it's, but it's necessary. He views him as generous. That Gideon is threshing such a quantity of wheat indicates that he's not just concerned for his own well-being, but he's concerned about the well-being of others. He's going to share this with others. God sees him as being careful. A wine press is sunken into the ground right, as opposed to a threshing floor, it's usually on the ground. He had thought this through in order to protect himself from the Midianites who might come and take his grain. God also sees him as humble. We see that in his his response to the angel of the Lord. It's respectful. It is honest. And God sees him as teachable. He is willing to listen. He's willing to reconsider. He's willing to rethink what he thought he knew. And God also sees him as courageous, something he maybe definitely doesn't see within himself. He's open to change. He's unafraid to ask real questions, and he's willing to be challenged. And for you and I, for you and I, and to those, uh, for those to whom we're connected, we can also be darkened by despair. This interaction then between Gideon and the angel of God is so important because it includes this promise. Did you catch that right at the end? Where God says, I will be with you. This perspective and this promise of God's presence bolsters Gideon and enables him to do much more than he thought possible. We help extend the reach of God's expression of value when we take time to recognize and commend the evidence of the character of God in each other just like we see in the interaction of Boaz, Ruth, Naomi, and their community, just like you have done for Teresa. And you realize just how uncomfortable that feels. But notice thirdly that on the threshing floor of our lives where the chaff flies, that redemption becomes possible. Redemption speaks of value and worth that is often measured by the extent or price someone is willing to pay or sacrifice. And that's what makes the words of Boaz so important to Ruth. She now realizes that she has worth. And we'll look at the idea of redemption a little further next week. But for now, think about how uncomfortable you are to hear a commendation or to receive encouragement. And part of the reason for that is the impact of the negative way in which we often view ourselves and the deceptive way in which criticism tends to stick and linger in our minds. But when you begin to function on the basis of your relationship with God and how God views you, then everything begins to change. Your choices begin to change. Your ability to handle setbacks begin to change. Your anticipation for the eternal promises of God in this beyond this life begins to change. Your openness towards others begins to change. Your courage in the face of difficulty begins to change. And even in the face of opposition, you can handle that differently because you know that God is with you. Your commitment to doing small things well begins to change as you see God go with you, strengthening you in weakness, granting you wisdom in confusion, instilling peace in a world of turmoil. Peace. Peace that anchors us until the fulfillment of all God's promises come to pass. When the chaff of our life flies, what remains is valuable to God. You are valuable to God. Those around you are valuable to God. On the threshing floor of our lives where the chaff flies, we need to allow, we, can, we need to allow the hardness of sin's influence to be broken. We need to understand our God-given value. We need to posture ourselves for the fullness of redemption 
it is there that we discover peace. The encouragement of, to Ruth and to Naomi, we read right at the end of uh, Ruth chapter 3, is to wait, she says. Wait, my daughter. And if you've been watching their hands throughout this chapter, you'll see the posture of peace is one of an open hand that anticipates and is willing to wait for the fulfillment of the Lord. Where hope, if you remember from Ruth chapter 1, required hands to hang on to someone. And where faith had hands that were willing to work hard, peace is the upturned open hand that Ruth extends to Boaz, that Boaz mirrors back to Ruth. And that Naomi indicates here at the close of the chapter. But waiting is hard. Anybody with me on that? Waiting means that there is something that is undone, unfinished, and incomplete that we really want, desire. However, we must remind ourselves that in the waiting, we are held by the promise of the presence of God. That he is with us. And it is there we find peace, wholeness, shalom within. Even if the circumstances are unchanged around us. Peace comes by allowing the chaff of our lives to be blown away. Through the deepening of our understanding of God's word. It leads us to confession of sin. And it, it causes us to examine our influences. That's what Psalm 1 teaches us. Peace comes by allowing the presence of Christ to guide our lives amid the, the swirling of uncertainty around us. That's the promise of the Christmas story, that, that the Christ would come to bring peace to the hearts of people. On the threshing floor of our lives where the chaff flies, Jesus is there confronting sin and renewing our value and instilling peace. Peace comes by renewing ourselves in the knowledge that Jesus is the one by whom sin and evil get sorted out, and we can trust him. You know, uh, before the revealed ministry of Jesus would begin, John the Baptist had some words to say. He gives us a reminder about the purpose of Jesus' coming to earth. He says this, the people, <clears throat> the people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. And John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than me will come. Whose straps of, whose sand, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. The season of Advent reminds us that we can wait upon Jesus to complete that which he has begun in our lives and in this world. In this, we find the celebration of Christ. This is Christmas. But maybe you're here today, and you're listening, and you've never truly understood the value that God places on you. That he loves you so much that he sent Jesus so that when you believe in him, you would not perish like chaff, but you would be found eternally valuable. And if that's the case, let me invite you to pray this prayer with me. A prayer that God asks, that asks God to break the hardness of our lives, the husks of our outer shell, if you will and to remove them like chaff in the wind so that you may discover your true worth. Would you pray this prayer if that is you? God, our Father, I thank you for your love and mercy. I admit that I am a sinner in need of your grace. Thank you for Jesus Christ who came to bring peace to our lives. Thank you for the price that he was willing to pay for sin by dying on the cross. In his sacrifice, and because he was raised to life, I am redeemed. I am valuable. Please forgive me. Jesus, enter into my life and teach me to live for you for the rest of my days. 
Fill my life with your Holy Spirit. Teach me to depend completely on you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And for those of you who feel undone by that which seems unfinished or incomplete, then let me encourage you to take your hands and turn them open and pray this prayer that Jesus has left for us. It's inspired by John chapter 14, verses 25 to 27. Just pray this prayer with me. God, our Father, continue to keep us attentive and teachable to your Holy Spirit. May your word in the presence of Christ bring peace within us. We confess the trouble, worry, and fear that we feel and ask for your wholeness and a willingness to wait in expectation for the fulfillment that will bring, that you will bring for glory to the name of Jesus and his kingdom of peace. May God use your prayer, knowing he has heard it, to strengthen your lives. Amen. And bring the music team up. Please stand as we sing. It is well with my...
just a reminder about our uh, kids' Christmas on Saturday. You do need to register for that. And then next Sunday is our special Christmas offering uh, to support the work uh, going on um, by our brothers and sisters in Christ through local churches in Ukraine. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And all God's people send. Amen. God be with you.